Hello and welcome to another episode of Geography Arcade. My name is Dave and this week we're going to talk about Pokemon and Endemism. Our story begins with Satoshi Tajiri. Satoshi grew up outside of Tokyo in a rural area known as Machida. It was a perfect spot for him to indulge his love of catching and collecting insects, a hobby that became so synonymous with his childhood friends, they would give him the nickname Dr. Bug, which I find very entertaining. As he entered adolescence, he left his youth behind to focus on a new obsession, arcade games. Tajiri adored the classic game Space Invaders so much that the owner of the arcade he frequented gave him his very own cabinet as a gift after he pumped coin after coin into the machine. At the time, Tajiri's studies were suffering. His teacher simply wrote him off as a lazy student. His academic future was in jeopardy, but he was able to study enough that he gained his high school diploma and got a place at the Tokyo National College of Technology studying computer science and electronics. Shortly before attending, he took his love of gaming a step further by writing out his own fanzine, the small DIY publication that went by the name Game Freak. Tajiri then became preoccupied with Nintendo's Famicom home console, taking the device apart to better understand how it worked. Tajiri and the friends he made while working on his zine decided to turn their hobby into a profession and established a company named after the magazine. The mission to make video games that would capture people's imaginations. He pitched a concept to Nintendo executives that was unlike anything they've seen at the time. As he envisioned it, players would wander a vast landscape collecting small creatures which they could train and send into battle against competitors. Each creature would have its own unique design and set of attributes, and if they were fully trained, they may even evolve to become something more powerful. The concept was based off of uh, the Japanese tradition of bug battling, which a lot of kids still do today, in which um, you get frequently beetles and um, set them in insect fighting matches. Tajiri went to work on his project and crossed the finish line in the mid-90s. By that point, he was running a skeleton crew of developers, with him having done most of the work on the game. When it was released in Japan as Pokemon Red and Blue in the autumn of 1996, few expected that it would make any kind of waves or succeed whatsoever. In 1996, the Game Boy's life cycle was at its end, and Nintendo sales were in decline after being essentially sucker punched by Sony's new PlayStation console. However, by the end of the year, his game managed to grow in popularity, and eventually it captured the imagination of the population of Japan. Tajiri made good on his desire to create a title where childhood joy and enthusiasm could be experienced by players and the gameplay proved infectious. The title sold a total of 10 million copies in Japan before being exported to America. I remember back to getting my first Game Boy. My parents had entered a local contest at the Belk, which is a department store where you can buy men's and women's clothing, uh, bedding, a bunch of dining room options. Uh, frequently, people will go and register for their weddings there with a the little scanner and scan everything. So it was odd that they were giving away a, a Game Boy. My parents rarely won these types of giveaways, but won this one, and for a birthday, I believe, I received my Tommy Hilfiger-branded Game Boy. I often think maybe this is worth something, but I don't think that there is a large market for Tommy Hilfiger-themed electronics. It seems like a very large market, although it could be something rather big, though I've managed to save mine over the years, and just as of this week replace the batteries in it only to turn on Pokemon Blue. I would take my Pokemon games uh, with me on the school bus and trade with my friends through the little cable that we had. I even had Pokemon cards that we would also trade and somehow figure out uh, the game itself. I think I was a little young to fully understand the strategy behind that game. 
More recently, I have played Pokemon cards with my wife. She has a ton of Pokemon cards. And of course, she chose the deck with all of the very powerful dragon and legendary Pokemon and won both rounds, though I did hold out for a good time. We both share a love of that, um, particularly with the cartoon that came out. We both watched as kids and rented from, I believe, I had a movie gallery and she had a blockbuster. The original Indigo League featured Ash Ketchum and Pikachu along with his friends Misty and Brock as they traveled across the Kanto region battling gym leaders to become the Pokemon master because Ash Ketchum is going to catch them all. Oftentimes we feel nostalgic about Saturday morning cartoons. I remember that I even had karate lessons once and my parents were trying to engage me to go and they said, you can either stay here and watch cartoons or you can go to karate lessons. And I said, I'm going to stay and watch cartoons. This is where Pikachu first came up. This is where a lot of the personalities that Pokemon had were manifest within the show. I really hadn't played any Pokemon games past Game Boy Color. That was when I was into it. That was when I had it. Even though I had a Game Boy Advance, I never owned any Pokemon games. Um, I didn't play any of the DS or uh, 3DS versions. But when the Nintendo Switch came out and rightfully took over the house life that we had led, I got back into playing Pokemon Let's Go Eevee uh, because Eevee is cuter than Pikachu, and that is by definition of my wife, and then Pokemon Sword. As of today, there are 122 different Pokemon games. That is a lot. But each entry has some sort of addition and a lot of the imagination, and some more science. Pokemon is rooted in this etymology that Tajiri originally had. There's science, there's environmentalism, there's care for creatures. Oftentimes you're battling Team Rocket, which is a corporation that is trying to steal and utilize Pokemon for evil and nefarious gains. And this is often congruent between the games, TV shows. There's some interesting science, though, in the newer ones that I didn't realize until recently. But in order to understand what these new games are doing, uh, we have to go back and do some learning. In college, I learned about endemism, which is this concept about natural selection, evolution. It is one of those key principles that came about during that Darwinian method. Endemism is the ecological state of a species being native to a single defined geographic region, such as an island, nation, country, or other defined zone or habitat type. Organisms that are indigenous to a place are not necessarily endemic to it if they are found elsewhere. There are two subcategories of endemism, paleoendemism and neoendemism. Paleoendemism refers to a species that were formerly widespread but are now restricted to a smaller area, while neoendemism refers to species that have recently arisen, such as through divergence and reproductive isolation. Endemism started, I guess, with Charles Darwin. Um, Charles Darwin is often considered the father of evolution. Darwin set out on this tour of South America on the HMS Beagle. This landed him in a region known as the Galapagos, which are off the coast of Central America that are a cluster of islands that he found had some very interesting creatures on. Charles Darwin made a lot of discoveries on the Galapagos, but he had captured a series of finches that he found very interesting and didn't really spend much time musing over until he sailed away. The journey ended in New Zealand before they returned to England in 1836. It was back in Europe when he enlisted the help of John Gould, a celebrated ornithologist in England. Gould was surprised to see the differences in the beaks of the finches and I identified the 14 different specimens as actually different species, 12 of which were brand new species, and concluded that they were unique to the Galapagos Islands. The other similar birds Darwin had brought back from South American mainland were much more common, but different than the new Galapagos species. 
Charles Darwin didn't actually come up with a theory of evolution on his voyage. As a matter of fact, his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, had already instilled the idea that species change through time in Charles. However, the Galapagos finches helped Darwin solidify his idea of natural selection. The favorable adaptations of Darwin's finch beaks were selected for over generations until they branched out to make new species. These birds, although nearly identical in all other ways to mainland finches, had different beaks. Their beaks had adapted to the type of foods they ate in order to fill different niches on the Galapagos Islands. Their isolation on the islands over long periods of time made them undergo speciation. Charles Darwin then began to disregard the previous thoughts on evolution put forth by John Baptiste Lamarck, who claimed species spontaneously as to generate from nothingness, which sounds pretty dumb to me. So let's think about ecological islands. The definition of an ecological island not only includes typical island formations like Hawaii or Madagascar, um, even smaller islands than that, like the kind of things that you would maroon Johnny Depp from Pirates of the Caribbean on. I guess that's Captain Jack Sparrow. But it's any system in which a favorable habitat is surrounded by inhospitable habitat, acting as a barrier to immigration and isolating the favorable habitat from other similar habitats. That's a lot of habitats, but what essentially that means is that there's different kinds of species based on these conclusions. That's why you have things like King Kong be so fascinating or why people believe that Bigfoot is a thing because mountains are very tall and are very hard to climb. If you have mountains as large as Everest that are not good for species to go over, um, you, you often... You, you rarely see any land-based species just casually hiking all the way to the top of that. That is, therefore, a barrier. It could be a lake. It could be a cave. Mountaintops, of course. Natural reserves. They can all be counted as insular systems. It's also exponential. So the further more the island is away from the source population, the lower its immigration rate of new species is. When a new animal arrives on an island, it's arriving into an ecosystem that is essentially lacking of a lot of different species or is underdeveloped in comparison to the full mature ecosystem of the mainland. This new animal, let's, let's call it Animal X, is finally free from the mainland. And let's say it has a predator on the mainland. Maybe it's free from competition for food or uh, other species or its main food source doesn't exist on the island. While it may have filled one role, uh, which we would call ecological niche, in terms of food competition and predation back on the mainland, it now finds itself in a very different world. Um, think about if you went to a small high school of 20 people and were the top dog, uh, and then went to a university where there were 30,000 different people, um, more like vice versa when we're talking about <laughs> ecological islands. Essentially, this new animal finds an empty niche, and this leads to adaptive radiation, whereby a single species colonizes an area and rapidly diversifies into a variety of descendant subspecies in order to exploit available niches. One of the first examples, and I think m most useful, is Oricorio, which I am probably butchering the name of. Um, some of these Pokemon, you never know. Essentially, this Pokemon is a bird-type Pokemon within the Sun and Moon games. The interesting thing about this bird Pokemon is it's found on all of these different islands, but its color and type changes based on the nectar that it drinks. So, for example, on the Ula Ula Island... Oricorio is covered in red feathers with two lines of black feathers along each of its wings and tail. And its plumage kind of resembles a, like a flamenco dress, I suppose. Uh, on the Mele Mele Island, Oricorio is primarily yellow. Most of its body is pale yellow with a line of longer feathers around its waist, kind of like a skirt. On the Akala Island, Oricorio has pink feathers... Its main body is a dark pink, while most of its other feathers are varying shades of pink. This is the direct reference to the finches that Darwin had, but more so the Hawaiian honey creeper, which I think has 51 different species in Hawaii. And that, that's just because of how separated those islands are. So there's also an Alolan 
Meowth. So we're familiar with Meowth. It's one of the first gen Pokemon. It's also um, the accomplice of Team Rocket's Jesse and James. The Alolan Meowth is actually described as feral and having undergone a, a population explosion after escaping from being pets. So feral cats are a, um, if you live in Hawaii, then you probably already know this, but they are a problem. They have bred out into the wilderness and they are killing a lot of the native life. The cats are non-native to Hawaii. They were brought there mainly as pets. There's been an interesting development in these feral cats as well. Some scientists were tracking these monk face seals who were dying, essentially. They looked like that they had they gotten a fish hook in their face and got all carved up. They were looking at their, um, their damage internally, neurologically, and they noticed this weird parasite. And it's a parasite that looked very similar to one that cats use on rats to essentially make them non-afraid of the cats. So it kind of works like how, I guess, zombies would work. So these cats that may be infected with this parasite would then um, create excrement. Great use of that word. And if any animals would consume it, it can take over their brain entirely. Collectively in Hawaii, there's over, I think, 5 million feral cats that are causing problems all over the island. This is a great reason why we should also spay and neuter our pets um, so that they don't take over and zombify the populace. Um, that's a, a great PSA that uh, the local shelters should use. And it's not exactly that these cats or Meowth are filling a niche that they're not natural to. It's that there's an overabundance of resources and they're taking over. This goes into a little bit of invasive species and there's another invasive species that's big in Hawaii, which are rats. So rats first arrived in the Polynesians around the uh, 1300s. However, it was the European species such as the Norway rat and the black roof rat that arrived with Westerners in the 18th century that would become the most numerous. Large populations introduced rats. Large populations of introduced rats were not only hunting bird eggs, but completely decimating sugar crops in the 19th century. As they had no natural predator to control their populations, the small Asian mongoose was introduced in order to control their numbers. However, this failed, as the rats were nocturnal, and the diurnal mongoose instead fed on native insects that ground-nesting bird species fed, driving many of these species to extinction, whilst the rats continued to feed on the eggs and wreak massive amounts of havoc. So it's explained that the ratata in... Pokemon Sun and Moon were also invasive. And in order to combat this, the Pokemon experts at the island brought in Yungos, which look a lot like a mongoose. Uh, they were brought in to control the population of Rattata, but this failed because the Rattata changed their circadian rhythm to become nocturnal. This is why you have these gray, these two different color grade uh, Rattata that have a dark type. Rattata normally aren't dark type and they completely avoid the young goes and in turn the young goes and the ratata have become very common within the alolan region another pokemon that is present within the sun and moon games is diglett diglett has had some changes diglett now has hair it's relevant that diglett is a ground type pokemon as he digs throughout the ground but his newfound hair gives him steel powers on Hawaii, there is this thing called Pele's hair, which is a reference to one of the Hawaiian gods. Really, it's volcanic fiberglass, and it's not something you should be brushing or stroking because it is very dangerous and it will pierce under your skin and cause serious harm to you. Diglett has some of the most dangerous hair in the Pokemon world. There are certainly other Pokemon that have unique forms. Grimer is one that has had some toxic sludge manipulate him. Um, Executor is a palm tree Pokemon that is now very tall. Some of them are related to interesting science subjects, but some of them are just for fun. Pelosand is a ghost Pokemon that essentially is a possessed sandcastle that mind controls adults. Its younger evolution, Sandygast, controls kids' minds. 
I like a more natural Pokemon like Morlul, which are nocturnal illuminating Pokemon that move spot to spot each night so it doesn't entirely drain an area of soil and nutrients. That's so nice. Morlul is probably one of the nicer grass Pokemon. If we move on to the Galarian region, there's two different types of Pokemon that really stood out to me that are of the Galarian type. First off, if you look at the trailers for some of the games, there's this new Weezing. Uh, Weezing is also an accomplice of Team Rocket. But in this one, the Weezing has a giant smokestack on its head and has green smoke coming out and a green smoke mustache. It's like Abraham Lincoln in a very t- tall top hat. And it's interesting because these Weezing actually evolved to adapt to the industrialization that the Galarian region have. So these Weezing consume pollution particles that contaminate the air. And then instead of leaving droppings, they clean the air. It's just clean air that comes out of these wheezing. It's interesting how now these species are adapting to humans. I want to get back more into invasive species and how humans evolved. It's interesting how these wheezing were essentially adapting to human change. Uh, There's a whole road to go down with human change, with invasive species, with the impact of humans on natural habitat. This leads into the Coruscant. So the Coruscant originally were, were wiped out due to climate change, literally. That's that's what it says in the Pokemon Pokedex. If you touch it, it is it absorbs your life force because it has no more nutrients that it can absorb. So it's filled that niche, a niche that, that the humans in the Pokemon world had created. It's a very sad piece of coral. With the recent release of Pokemon Sword, I think people were expecting a game that was that was meant for the console and was going to, to change Pokemon forever. And I think people were disappointed when they learned that it was going to be a, an evolution of Pokemon, but it wasn't going to be what they had thought. There was a noticeable lack in a lot of the Pokemon that were located within the Pokedex. Essentially, Pokemon from all the different games were not fully returning in this game. There were missing holes, and this made a lot of people very angry. Well, one day I hope that we can get a Pokemon MMO where we just capture all of the different Pokemon. I think locking games into the regions and exploring what that region is and how Pokemon adapt to it is way more educational and reflective of the real world. Pokemon are a lot like our pets. Goodness knows I love my pets to death. My second dog was found by the shelter on one of the coldest nights of the year in a box with seven other puppies. And when we adopted him, he did fairly well being in the cold. We thought that he would enjoy summer temperatures more, but we've noticed that he has been heating up and getting a little tired after each walk. But for some reason, he does better in the cold, and maybe that's his upbringing. While he has such a better life with us, I think a part of him is influenced by the way that he was brought up. I think about this while I go on dog walks and go to a particular part of the neighborhood where there are not only gray squirrels, but black squirrels. Black squirrels are only in this one little complex. They don't ever come down our street. They are just there. They are strange and shiny. I've never seen a a shiny squirrel like that before. It makes me appreciate the uniqueness and rarity of animals. A lot like I appreciate the uniqueness and rarity of Pokemon, even the shiny ones. And I think Pokemon ultimately teaches us about friendship and to appreciate the beauty of natural order. Thanks for listening to the second episode of Geography Arcade. If you like the show, please throw us a rating. Uh, It's a brand new show. It's on a a brand new feed. um, And any feedback that you can give would be great. As always, we have a Discord uh, along with all of our social media. That's at Geography Arcade. All of this is in the link in the show notes. It's one link. You can get to everywhere from there. This week, let me know what your favorite Pokemon is. I think everybody has a favorite, even if they haven't really played that much Pokemon. If you don't have a favorite Pokemon, maybe now is a great time to also find your favorite Pokemon. I used to not have a favorite, and then I had asked my wife when we were dating what kind of Pokemon I would be. And she replied, a Mr. Mime. And I asked her, why the heck am I a Mr. Mime? And she said, because Mr. Mime is very helpful with Ash's mom. And he cleans the dishes. So I think that Mr. Mime, and even the Galarian Mr. Mime, who tap dances, is my favorite Pokemon. We also have a Patreon, so if you want to support the show monetarily, it helps me get new equipment, that helps me up the production of all of these, uh, that 
in turn will help me make better episodes. I hope this is a library of geographic subjects that people can listen to for a long time. If I had aspirations for this show, I want to be the very best geography podcast like no one ever was. To record them is my real test. To broadcast them is my cause. <laughs>